Okay, welcome back. In this section, we're going to extend the ideas we did in the last two sections and bring in uncertainty. But first, we're going to talk about how does data consistently estimate the same regression line for a single data set. So in the last section, we showed results from several simple linear regression models, and I said, believe you me, they came from Stata. Take that on faith for now. Again, for example, when relating arm circumference to height, the first thing we looked at using a random sample of 150 Nepali children less, less than a year old, I told you that the resulting regression equation was given by what you see there. And I told you this came from Stata, and I will show you how to do regression with Stata shortly. But what I want to give you some sense of is how does Stata estimate this equation? How does Stata or any other program estimate the equation? In theory, if I give this data set to different statistical package, they should all come up with the same answer. And if I run this multiple times in Stata with the same data set, it should consistently give me the same answer. So there must be some algorithm that will yield the same results for the same data set. Well, the algorithm to estimate the equation of the line is called the least squares estimation. The idea is to find a line that gets closest to all the points in the sample. So how to define closeness to multiple points? In regression, Closeness, if you will, is defined as the cumulative squared distance between each point's y value and the corresponding value of y hat for that point's x. In other words, the squared distance between an observed y value and the estimated y value for all points with the same x. So here's a picture of what we're trying to do. I didn't trace all these vertical distances that I was trying to describe before, but these dashed lines from each point, the perpendicular dashed lines from each observed data point to the red line are the distances I'm speaking of. So some points get close to the line, some points are farther away. And it really considers all, if I were to do this dotted line for all 150 points on the picture, that's what it's measuring. Each distance is, you know, by what we've said before, is y, the observed value, minus the corresponding value on the line. For a given data point, it's the y value observed minus the equation of the line applied to that value's x. And this is computed for each data point in the sample. And then the algorithm to estimate the equation of the line is called least squares estimation. What's going on here is the values chosen for the slope and intercept are the values that minimize the cumulative distances squared across all data points in our sample. So it minimizes, you would sum up the distance of each observed y value from its corresponding value on the line, square that, and you do that across all data points in the sample. And then the values of beta naught hat and beta one hat that are chosen are the values that minimize this sum of square distances. And that's why it's called least squares estimation. But these values chosen for the intercept and the slope are just estimates based on a single sample. If we were to have a different random sample of 150 Nepali children from the same population, the resulting estimate would likely be different, i.e. the values that minimize the cumulative square distance from the second sample points would likely be slightly different than the ones that did for this. And what am I getting at here? I'm getting at sampling variability. The results we get will vary depending on the sample we took. So as such, all regression coefficients, like the estimated slope and even the intercept, have an associated standard error they can be made used to make statements about the true relationship between mean y and x based on a single sample. So for example, with this Nepali children in height example that we looked at to kick off regression in general, the estimated regression equation was y hat, the estimated arm circumference on average, was 2.7 plus 0.16 times height. And here beta 1 hat is 0.16. And the standard error, which we'll show you in a minute, comes from Stata, is actually 0 0.014. And similarly, the intercept is 2.7 as an estimate with a standard error estimate of 0.88. So it turns out this is nothing new. These really, if we think about this, these are just means and mean differences, right? The intercept is some sort of mean, whether it's relative to our data or not, and the slopes are nothing more than mean differences, as we've defined over and over again. So it turns out the random sampling behavior of these regression coefficients is just like we saw for means and mean differences when we were considering them before. It turns out it's going to be normal for large samples 
those with n greater than 60, be a normal distribution centered at the true value. So, for example, the sampling distribution of beta 1 hat slopes, estimated slopes from all samples, random samples of 150, would be centered at the true value, beta 1, that we can't see, but vary in a normal fashion around that true value. And as such, we can use the same ideas to create 95% confidence intervals and p-values that we did for means and mean differences before. So again, from this equation, relating arm circumference to height, the estimated slope was 0.16. And the standard error was 0.014, estimated standard error. So to create a confidence interval, what we do is just do the same old, same old, exploiting the properties of the normal curve. Most, 95% of the samples we take, we'll get a slope within two standard errors of the true slope. So we'll exploit that. Take our estimated slope, add and subtract two standard errors estimates, and we come up with a 95% confidence interval of about 0.13 centimeters in arm circumference per centimeter in height to 0.19. Similarly, we can do the hypothesis testing approach. And what do you think the null hypothesis would be in terms of a slope? Well, if there were no association between arm circumference and height, that means our estimated mean for arm circumference would be the same for any height group which would imply the line, the true line, is flat. It doesn't matter what your x is, you're going to get the same y. And that translates, in, and remember, the slope is nothing more than a mean difference, so analogous to what we did before as well, the null is that this quantity is zero. No association. This mean difference per one unit difference in x is zero. It's the same old, same old. Start by pretending the null is true and calculate the standardized distance of our estimate from zero, the assumed truth. So we call that t, but it's really just a distance. We take the difference between b1 hat and 0 and divide it by the number of units in the standard error. So what we get here is 0.16, the estimated slope, divided by the estimated standard error of 0.014. We get a distance of nearly 11.4, very, very far away in terms of standard errors. And the p-value is the probability of being 11.4 or more standard errors away from zero on a normal curve. It's the probability of getting our sample result or something even more extreme if the null is true. And of course, in this situation, that would be a very low value. P would be way less than 0 0.001. If you're more than 11 standard errors out on a normal curve, the area in those tails is really small. So let's just summarize their findings here, and then we'll show you how to do this in Stata. This research used simple linear regression to estimate the magnitude of the association between arm circumference and height in Nepali children less than 12 months old using data on a random sample of 150. A statistically significant positive association was found. The results estimate that two groups of such children who differ by one centimeter in height will differ on average by 0.16 centimeters in arm circumference. And the 95% confidence interval for that difference, that mean difference is 0.13 to 0.19 centimeters. All right, finally, finally, the moment you've been waiting for, how are we going to do this in Stata? Well, it turns out it's a really nice, straightforward thing, but you have to have your data in Stata. So if you have your y and your x values entered in separate columns in Stata, so each row would represent one child, and then the first column, for example, could be the arm circumference measure, and the second would be height for each of the children. If you have your x and y values entered and stated, then the linear regression command you use is the regress command. You type regress, and then whatever you've called your outcome, y, and whatever you called your predictor x. So in this data set, here's a snippet. I'm not going to show you all 150 observations, but the first five children here are listed here, and each one has a value for arm circumference, and each has a value for height. I've called my y variable arm circ, which is short for arm circumference, and my x variable height, which is self-explanatory. But you can call it whatever you want. If I type regress arm circ height at the command line in my data and state, I get this whole bunch of output here. So let's keep our eyes on the prize to start. Remember the resulting equation was y hat equals 2.7 plus 0.16x. So where did I get this from this output? Well, if you look in the column in the second table on the bottom, the second column is labeled COF, which is short for coefficient. And that's where we're going to find all of our information on regression coefficients, which include the intercept and slope. The intercept 
is always called in the first column underscore C-O-N-S, which stands for constant. You don't multiply it by anything. It's always the same value. So the row labeled const, where it intersects the second column, will give us the value of B naught hat. So it's 2.6959, but I rounded it to 2.7 when I presented the equation to you. Then all the slopes we get will be in rows labeled with the name of the variables that we called our x's. So for example, B1 hat from this, the slope of height, is where the coefficient column meets the row labeled height. And it's 0.1579, etc., which I rounded to 0.16x. And then if we go over to the right, you can see on the last two columns, we get the lower and upper endpoints for the confidence interval that we already did by hand. And in that column third from the left, that's our p-value for testing the null, that the true slope, the true association is zero. And you can see the t-value next to that. I, mine was 11.4. They get 11.15, and the difference is because of I rounded and they didn't. But So let's extend these ideas to bring in uncertainty to estimate the differences for more than one unit difference in x. So I'm going to ask you to give an estimate and a 95% confidence interval for the mean difference in arm circumference for children 60 centimeters tall compared to children 50 centimeters tall. Well, from the previous set of lectures way back when, we know that this estimated mean difference is found by taking the difference in the x values, 60 minus the difference in the x values, 60 minus 50, which is 10, and multiplying it by the difference in arm circumference mean per one unit difference in x. So we have a 10 unit difference in x, and we multiply that by the slope of 0.16, and the average difference in arm circumference between 60 centimeters to 50 centimeters is 1.6 centimeters, and those who are taller would have higher average. So how do we get the standard error for this? Well, it turns out, as it turns out, standard error, we just do the same thing to the standard error for the original slope. When we take multiples of the slope, the standard error multiplies as well. So the estimated standard error of what we've just computed, 10 times V1 hat, is equal to 10 times the estimated standard error for the slope estimate alone. So in our situation, that estimated standard error for the slope was 0 0.014, and we'll multiply that by 10 because we want the standard error for a 10-unit difference in arm circumference average estimate. So that turns out to be 10 times 0 0.014 is 0 0.14. And if we do that, the 95% confidence interval for this mean difference then is found by taking our estimate, 10 times the slope estimate, plus or minus 2 times standard error of 10 times the slope estimate. So if you do that, it turns out to be the estimate 1.6 plus or minus 2 times 0 0.14, which gives us a confidence interval of roughly 1.3 centimeters to 1.9 centimeters. And notice that that's just 10 times the endpoints of the confidence interval we got for the one unit difference in height, the slope itself. Let's give another example. Let's go back to this hemoglobin impact cell volume result. Remember the equation of the regression line that I told you before relating mean hemoglobin levels to packed cell volume percent from state, I gave that to you. I said y hat equals 5.77 plus 0 0.20 times x. Let me show you how I got this in state. Here's a snippet. There were 21 observations here, so theoretically I could put them all on the slide. I'll just show you the first five. So person number one had an estimated hemoglobin of 13.5 grams per deciliter and a packed cell volume of 35%. So I called my hemoglobin variable capital H, lowercase b, and my packed cell volume PCV, all in capital letters. So if I were to type regress those two variables, HB and then PCV, that would give me the results I just quoted to you. And here you go. And I'll let you parse this output to see if you can recreate the equation I got. But look, we get a confidence interval here and a p-value. So after counting for sampling variability, p-value is very low. This data tells you it's zero. It's really not zero, but it's a very small number, less than 0.01, which suggests that our result was very, very, very unlikely if there were no association at the population level, if the true slope is zero. And the 95 per confidence interval is roughly from 0.1 to 0.3. So it includes only positive possibilities, which is consistent with that p-value. It's the same idea with the computation 
of the 95% confidence interval and p-value as we saw before. However, we only have 21 subjects in the sample. So there's a slight change, and it's very much analogous to what we did with means and differences from smaller samples before. It turns out we still know what would happen under random sampling in terms of the variability and estimated slopes from random samples of size 21 across the samples, but it's not quite normal. It follows the t-distribution, just like we saw with means and difference in means before. And the distribution it follows has n minus 2 degrees of freedom. Why is that? Well, n is the total amount of information we have, and we have to estimate for our regression two quantities, a slope and an intercept. So the degrees of freedom is the total amount of information minus the number of things we have to estimate. So to get a 95% confidence interval for the true slope, we're going to take our estimate, b1 hat, and add and subtract, and we're going to pull the number from a t-distribution. We're going to pull the number that cuts off 95% in the middle of the distribution and has degrees of freedom n minus 2. So this number will just be slightly more than 2. And it turns out in this example, we would pull it from a t-distribution with 19 degrees of freedom. So in order to get 95% confidence, we have to go 2.09 standard errors instead of 2. And the resulting confidence interval is our estimate, 0 0.2 plus or minus 2.09 times 0 0.046. How about getting a p-value for testing the null that this true association, the average difference in hemoglobin levels per one unit difference in packed cell volume, our slope, is 0? Well, again, we assume the null is true. And we calculate the standardized distance of our result from zero. And if we do that, the same mechanics as we've been doing all through this raw distance divided by the units in the estimated standard error, we get something that was 4.35 standard errors above zero. That's pretty far out. Now, admittedly, because we have a smaller sample, our sampling distribution is not quite normal. We're dealing with a t-curve with 19 degrees of freedom, but we're way out there nevertheless. And if you were to look this up in a t-table or go back to what Stata gave you, you'd see that the p-value is very small, less than 0.001, which jibes their confidence interval, as we said, that did not include zero. So the estimated slope is 0.2 with a 95% confidence interval 0.1 to 0.30. How, how to interpret these results? Well, one way to sort of lay this out, we could say something like, based on a sample of 21 subjects, we estimated that packed cell volume is positively associated with hemoglobin levels. We estimated that a 1% increase in PAC cell volume is associated with a 0.2 gram per deciliter increase in hemoglobin on average. That's one way of saying slope. Accounting for sampling variability, this increase could be as small as 0.10 grams per deciliter or as large as 0.3 grams per deciliter in the population of all subjects. In other words, we estimated that the another way to say the slope and just make it clear that it's just nothing more than a mean difference is you could say we estimated that the average difference in hemoglobin levels for two groups of subjects who differ by 1% of packed cell volume is 0.2 grams per deciliter on average. You could phrase it this way as well. And I, do, I always do this because I want to remind you that this is there's nothing really fancy about the slope. It's nothing more than a mean difference. I just want to keep reminding you of you that. Just like we saw before, we're just estimating all across a range of predictor values instead of necessarily between two groups only. So what about the intercepts? Where is the love for the intercepts? Well, in this section, all the examples have confidence intervals for the slope or multiples of the slope. We could also create confidence intervals and p-values for the intercept in the same manner. Sampling behavior, et cetera, is normal, and the same approaches apply. And if smaller samples, we'd have the t. Thing. And Stata gives a confidence interval in the output. However, as we noted in the previous sections, many times the intercept is just a placeholder, and we need it to specify the equation of the line, but in unto itself does not describe a useful scientific or substantive quantity. As such, the 95% confidence intervals and p-values are not always necessary or relevant to what we're doing, even though we can compute them.